um, to that's what I was just going to say. Welcome to Exploring Your Program, Connections to Land-Based Learning webinar. And this presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website in the upcoming weeks. So I want to start us off in a good way and introduce Sequalia, our Squamish Nations elder. And she's going to start us off in a good way and open us up with a prayer and just acknowledge um, all the territories that we're calling in from. And so, Anne, if you could start us off, that would be great. Awesome. Hi, Archton. I welcome each and every one of you to um, those who are in the lower mainland, the unceded Coast Salish territories of Squamish Nation, where I'm from, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam First Nations. And I um, welcome you today to our gathering and um, just want to say that we need to come together in Chomo and Squawin is how we say it in Squamish and Hamalkamalam. We say Natsamat and Squawin, one heart and one mind. And I do know from um, the NADAP gathering I attended that every nation has that word or phrase that means one heart and one mind. So today's about sharing and learning and respect. And so my grandfather shared with me that we all um, pray to a higher power known by many names and that we have to respect each other's ways when we do our spiritual ceremonies. And um, he said that el him and the elder said that you um, don't have your hands like this crossed or like this or this because you're closing off yourself to the energy from creator the ancestors and each other so i'm just going to ask you all to put your hands open take a couple breaths just to calm yourself so that we come together in chomo and squawin and then i'll say a prayer I'm, I will close with the song and prayer, but I'm just going to do this prayer to start us off. Chenkwe mentomi kakakanik chesiam, yonsyon so tenoi up in manman, disquiles deceits, yonsyo manman squalwen, yonsyo manman snachem, tsetsop, disquiles deceits. Asking you, Creator, to watch over and guide and protect each and every one of your children gathered here today and also asking our ancestors to watch over and protect us. Asking you, Creator, to help all your children with the um, work that we're gathered here to do today, to be in Chomo and Shkwalwin, one heart and one mind. Asking you, Creator, to let all of us hear the snatchum, the words that are going to be shared, take into our heart what's meant for us, set aside what we don't need today, to bring back another day when we need it. And that we um, have open minds and hearts to the knowledge transfer and sharing of views and being able to ask questions and to help us with the work we do for our manman, our children and the foundation we create for them to move forward from the present and into the future. So asking you, Creator, again, let today's work be yet one hall tzitzap, excellent work. Tama kwitsi snechem hoichacha. Those are my words. Thank you. And um, let's have a great meeting, everyone, because we have a lot to talk about and share for our manman, our children. Back to you, Denise. Thank you, Anne, for starting us in a good way and welcoming us on our territories. I know we're each coming from a different area of the province. Uh, Lois and I are in um, the same location. We are at Park Royal, so happy to be on the uh, shared territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people and grateful for Lois to be um, sharing the, or doing all the work behind the scenes as we share 
our information with you. So um, let's get, oh, and so Lois, did you wanna just say hi? Hello everyone. Okay. So um, Lois is being safe. We're physically distancing. We're about 12 feet away from each other. And so I uh, just, uh, in the time of COVID, we are taking uh, safety measures. So since COVID-19, um, we're all delivering our work in a different way. And uh, this webinar is one example of how we're doing that. So we have developed a three part series titled um, Exploring Your Program, which you can find on our website page. And it shares a variety of tools and links with you. So we believe in healthy children, self-determining and vibrant First Nations children and families and communities. The goal of this webinar is to provide participants with resources and knowledge of how to weave the relationship of land-based healing and teachings into your program and community. I'm just looking at the beautiful pictures that are being shared and it, it's just reminded me about being grounded here and why we're here. Um, so in the latter half of this webinar, we're going to have our panelists join us and there's going to be an opportunity to ask your questions. I've had a few questions wondering if people are, are muted and this is a webinar and everybody is muted. All of the participants are automatically muted and the way to communicate with us is to through the chat box. Um, you can comment with each other and the question and answers uh, that you have for the panelists to put that in the Q&A box. So we'll answer those questions um, after the panelists give their presentation. So our Head Start advisors and our panel of experts are here to share what is needed to operate a land-based program and how to assess and navigate risk assessments and mitigation. Throughout this webinar, we're going to conduct a few poll questions for the participants who are on the live webinar. So you'll see um, uh, the poll will come up on your screen and then you can answer the questions and press submit and then we'll show the results of that. So our four objectives for this webinar are to review the Exploring Your Program series, understand the benefits of land-based learning, explore the importance of land-based learning during these unprecedented times, and learn tools and strategies to incorporate the land-based learning into your Head Start program. This is our First Nations Health Authority Head Start Advisors team. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, each of these ladies for all of the hard work that they have put into bringing this information together to share it with you. Uh, I have so much gratitude for them and their hard work as they continue to support the communities um, from around the province. So Ada uh, supports the Vancouver Island team or the region and Lori works with our communities in the interior and Lynn, she is our regional advisor for the Northern communities and Tara, she uh, supports both the Fraser Salish and Vancouver coastal communities. So at the end of the presentation, you'll find the contact information for each of the First Nations Head Start advisors. Um, and they're looking forward to supporting you as we continue this journey. Uh, my name is Denise Lassert. I am the Senior Specialist for Healthy Children and Youth. Um, and so you're gonna hear from each one of us during this webinar. So it is my honor to introduce to you the panelists that we have today. Uh, we have Sequalia, who's joining us, Hamaluk, uh, Liz Williams, and Casey Neathaway. 
Sequalia is the knowledge carrier and elder advisor from Squamish nations with strong indigenous worldviews, ancestral knowledge and traditional teachings. She's widely respected and acknowledged for her work and her energy commitment to her community. Thank you for being with us, Anne. Um, later on, Sequalia will be sharing her perspective um, from an Indigenous woman living in an urban setting. Hamaluk uh, has been the daycare manager and Head Start coordinator since 1997 at, I'm, I'm going to pronounce this, so let me know if I get it, uh, Liz, Wonk uh, Simalug. Uh, which means um, cradle of the language. So Liz promotes language and culture in the daycare. Uh, the program has an on-site um, teats, which is grandmother, and uncles to learn and teach the language with the children. Uh, the children are exposed to their language four hours a day five days a week. Isn't that beautiful that they get 20 hours of language every week? So this year, due to COVID, the daycare program has uh, more of an outdoors. Uh, they have time more outdoors than, and they come indoors for eating, sleeping, and uh, washrooms. Uh, the daycare families at Liz's Center, uh, the families are really included in the uh, local community school and they're welcome to participate on any of the land activities and uh, with either their extended family members or their parents. So Liz continues to find ways of being during these pandemic times and on the land has proven to be the safest method that is revealed to her Gitsan people, that is, that is relevant to her Gitsan people. Thank you, Liz, for being with us. And we look forward to hearing more about your land-based program. Casey Neithaway is the Interior Manager of Environmental Public Health Services for FNHA. He is a certified public health inspector and Casey is bringing many gifts with us. He has held leadership roles uh, in, in environmental health, community care licensing, Head Start programs, and is the president of the Canadian Institute of Public Health Inspectors for BC and the Yukon branch. Casey is passionate about working as a partner with First Nations community to identify, mitigate, environmental health concerns and to improve health outcomes for Indigenous populations while supporting land-based programs and food systems. Thank you, Casey, for joining us today and we look forward to you sharing your expertise. All of our, all of our panelists have unique backgrounds that make them the ideal selection for an interesting and diverse panel discussion which we will get to in the second half of this presentation. In our last webinar that we held in August, we spoke about the Restart Planning Toolkit. So the topics that we covered in this webinar uh, addressed things like uh, what items the communities need to um, think about when they're reopening their program. Uh, we shared FNHA resources, we, sure, we shared some external resources, we talked about Head Start operations and staffing, and we really highlighted the outreach model, but we reviewed all of the out, uh, delivery models. And uh, lastly, we covered regional training. So FNHA has numerous resources for you to stay connected and up to date with new information. And we invite you to check out our new FNHA app. Uh, we'd like to draw your attention to the new recently updated Head Start um, on Reserve website. And this is where you're going to find these resources as well as the webinar, uh, the restarting webinar, as well as that, that's where you'll find this webinar uh, after it gets um, loaded, uploaded. Um, so we have a list of resources that we'll share at the end of the webinar. And now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Ada. 
Thank you, Denise. <laughs> uh, so next <laughs> on our first poll. So our poll will be coming up. Um, how many of the we believe statements are there? Two, six, 10 or 12. So please have a look at those statements and figure out or decide which one it is. So please participate. So it's A, B, C, or D. Okay, you guys can, you can vote. Hmm. Or you can guess. <laughs> I'd vote, but we can't. Okay. Are panelists ready to vote or participants? Are the vote buttons working? Oh, 87 and 78% voted. Excellent. Okay, well, here are the results from um, the questions. So 21% believe it's two, 26% believe it's six, 10% believe it's 28, and 25% and believe that there's 12. And the magic number is 12. Am I correct? I believe so. Thank you for participating in their poll. So here, here, are, here is a couple of our belief statements that children under the guidance of elders, knowledge keepers or knowledge sharers will learn to love through, throughout their lifetime. That our children have the right to live proudly as First Nations people in the lands of our ancestors. Many communities recently experienced how flexible Head Start is, for example, Communities may have shifted from their existing Head Start model of delivery into an outreach delivery model. Staff working from home developed and distributed resources, resource kits to the families in their communities. The beauty of Head Start is that it's flexible. It's a flexible program that can be adapted to meet the needs of your communities. Now, be, now may be a good time for your community to reassess or adapt as necessary. During this next section of this presentation, we'll be sharing examples of points to consider when developing or implementing concepts of a land-based learning program. The process of exchanging knowledge creates, a path, creates pathways to facilitate a combination of information and understanding about ourselves, our communities, and the land that guides the way we conduct ourselves and the decisions that we make. For generations, First Nations communities used elements such as life cycles, directions and the seasons of spring, summer, fall and winter to build and to sustain their lives. Each, tori, each territory has a variety of traditional beauty of land, water, forest, mountains or trains. As communities take a closer look at their seasonal or cultural calendars and overall planning for their program development, they may be searching for ways to explore new concepts. We have witnessed many communities weave the relationship of our land-based healing and teachings into their Head Start programs. Beautiful. We are in unprecedented times and continue to learn how to live with COVID-19. Our mental health wellness has been impacted through the pandemic. And we know the importance of children attending a learning environment. We have witnessed how many communities have reconsidered how to hold the safe place for their children and families by adjusting their delivery model to land-based learning. Exploring your program, connections to the land-based learning. First of all, it's about getting started. Administration, budgeting, staffing, planning, 
training. What are your hours of operation going to be? What are the schedules going to look like? What are the various materials will you need? How are you going to be building on your curriculum? And most of all, incorporating those six key components and getting community, family, parent involvement. So as we look at the next slide, you may be asking the question, where do I start? This webinar, along with previous webinars, resource tools found on our Head Start website and the experienced Head Start advisors were all good resources to help you get started on your journey. Since the beginning of COVID-19, we have learned a lot of information. If you have not already done so, we encourage you to log on to our website to review the Restart Planning Toolkit presentation. During this webinar, we share numerous resources and approaches to support the reopening of programs, services during this pandemic. We know that communities make different choices about how best to use their Head Start funding. It is important to continually monitor and evaluate your plans and approach as your community's needs may change. For example, you may have operated a licensed preschool program before the pandemic. Now that the model may not be meeting your community needs and an outreach model of delivery is a better fit during this time. Or you may want to explore how land-based programming would work in your community. Your Head Start advisor is here to support you and as you assess the right model for your community. On the other hand, some communities may not receive Head Start funding. The First Nations Health Authority Head Start advisors offer support to all of our BC First Nation communities to help them to understand what Head Start approaches are, such as incorporating the six key components in early learning. If you are familiar with Head Start, you know that one of the components is parent and family involvement. This is where we recognize the support and the role of parents and family as the primary teachers and caregivers of their children. If your community is considering adjusting your delivery model, we encourage you to hold discussions with your families and communities in order to plan and envision what new land-based program could look like and hold space to allow for transfer of knowledge and exchange of information so your program can meet your community's needs and you're including all of your community assets. This will look differently in each community, depending on the outcomes in your community consultation. There are multiple resources and examples at the end of this webinar. We are going, we are at, we're going to take um, a more in-depth look at topics such as administration administration, program planning and development, hours of operation and daily schedules. Remember, these are only suggestions and it can be flexible to meet the individual needs of your community. Each day in a land-based program is unique and offers ongoing and new experiential learning. Think about a time when we have planned a day and something changes to that plan. Often, this is what when a meaningful opportunity arises. It's having that flexibility. For example, it suddenly begins to rain. And instead of responding, oh no, it's raining, what are we gonna do? You take a moment to observe and adapt to this change. Suddenly, right before your eyes, you witness the children holding vibrant conversations and careful observation, such as witnessing the precious life cycles that popped out during the sudden rainfall. The magical sounds of water dropping into the leaves around you and the beautiful smell that the rain has carried. As we are role models, we must be flexible and continue to adapt to the environment in which we are in. Here are a few thoughts to consider. Consider the budget materials and resources. Outdoor learning is very economical. Some programs may have a home base which can be used as a shelter for when the weather while along providing dry, warm area. For example, a gazebo or covered structure. This area may also be used for pickup or drop off or to hold parent meetings. Consider partnering with other departments in your community or local organizations for items such for materials and supplies. 
If you are not returning to the meeting place for snacks or lunch, consider what you might need for bag snack or lunches. What does that look like? Staffing program ratios can be quite flexible and using parents as volunteers will make a difference. High quality outdoor regional weather appropriate outerwear is important. Backpacks for personal items such as bear, bear bells. <clears throat> items for a building, a dry and warm space. For example, using tarps, ropes, blankets, whatever's available. Two-way radio, GPS, first aid kits for each child's backpack and for staff. Bringing with you wild plant food guides with images or pictures. A wagon is handy for transport, transporting, transportation of items. When we move to the next slide, we talk about when we hold meaningful conversations with our staff and families, we are creating a shared understanding to better equip and share crucial information. Program planning and development. Looking at policies and procedures, as well as a handbook for parents and staff handbooks, factor in emergency preparedness, evacuation planning, create maps on where you gather. Registration age groups. Some may choose to offer three or four year old camps as the children are potty trained and can carry their own bags, feed themselves, etc. When we're looking at our hours of operation and our daily schedule, Daily schedules can be flexible and adaptive to meet the needs of your community. <clears throat> Consider your arrival and departure times as they vary. Be flexible with drop off and pick up. Be flexible with your enrollment. For example, think about part-time or full-time. Consider the essential work schedules and how your program can accommodate their needs. For example, these families would drop off earlier and pick and pick up later than other families. Please note that your First Nations Health Authority Head Start Advisors can also review your existing handbook and policies, procedures, and support you through these changes. Thank you, and I'm gonna hand this over to Lori. It is important when holding conversations in regards to designing your program to know your why. Take a closer look at how through holding trainings, collaborate team building, along with seeking the support from your First Nations Health Authority Head Start Advisor. When we do this, we provide an inclusive, strategic and informative process. And the conversation will shift towards the when questions and who we may collaborate, collaborate with um, as we go into team building and training needs. It is important for first aid, outdoor safety, building confidence and ability to offer the program, identifying poisonous plant species, outdoor safety, how to identify harvest traditional plants, foods or medicine. Also staffing needs, connect with your local child care licensing officer to discuss your plan and needs. Address human resources, needs such as job descriptions, roles, and responsibilities. Identify any materials, supply needs for the staff, such as high quality coats, boots, and hats. Build buy-in on staffing, replace, staffing placement, whether indoors or outdoors. First Nations people, we are the stewards of the land. Our ancestors, elders and knowledge keepers have shared teachings with us, such as thanking the plants growing while asking permission to harvest from our mother earth who has sustained us for many generations. It has been said that our blood memory can be felt on a deep cellular level, just as the plants will offer themselves and stand out from the, the other ones. It is important to acknowledge the spirit, the plant, spirit of the plant and how you will use this medicine to feed other people. Ceremony is the center of all that we do. And so watch where you step. Listen with your heart, body, mind, and spirit. 
While traditional medicines and practices can be incorporated into your program, it would be advised to consult with knowledge keepers in your community to be building land-based curriculum. For many years, we have witnessed communities gather and develop curriculum with knowledge holders, elders, traditional healers, community members, and parents to participate in experimental learning during the planning process. Providing the opportunity to offer or speak to other protocols, teachings for consideration, such as offerings, prayers, or other honorings. We suggest that you follow your community's protocols while promoting awareness, inclusion, and belonging. This is a wonderful opportunity to engage your community, find their talents, and ask for their help. For example, other community programs may assist in designing and or building picnic tables. Do you have a community members that are interested in developing a community garden or maybe caretaking the garden? Reach out and find your, your community partners and collaborate. The benefits of land-based learning. As a child is the learner, we have observed at the importance of meeting them where they are at. It's about the process, not the outcome. It's about building the children's confidence as they learn through play in their natural environments. Outdoor play supports our respect and connection to the land, which is important for our mind, body, and spiritual well-being. There are many benefits and life skills to be learned through risky play, which include fostering problem solving, building resilience and persistence, just to name a few. Land-based learning has endless possibilities, including sensory and fine gross motor play. Introducing a child to experience of touch, smell, listen and observation further builds upon their appreciation while enhancing their social, emotional, spiritual well-being. We continue to discuss how to weave our relationship of land-based healing and teachings into our Head Start programs, such as culture and language. Share and explore teachings of our plant foods and medicines and other traditional ways of living. Promote and inform animal awareness and safety. Invite language speakers, elders, or knowledge holders to share their gifts and talents. Examples, take a medicine walk. Learn how to harvest, gather, and preserve plants, foods, and medicines. Prepare a meal using the plants gathered. Prepare a meal together. Develop a recipe book. Refer to www.firstvoices.com to incorporate your language. Education, develop and create opportunities for language literacy, phys physical activity and motor development. Oral storytelling songs and creation stories have been passed down for many generations. This is a great way to explore the history of our plants, medicines, with well developing our relationship with various elements of the land, such as lakes, rivers, and forests. Examples. Use your traditional language, encourage social development and competence. Use skills such as math, science, and concepts. Provide the children with small notebooks to reflect upon what children witness or observe. Request families to donate, collect tides, bones for dinosaur dig, shells for counting, rocks for storytelling, etc. Okay, um, health promotion. Going on a walk, hike supports not only physical and mental well being, it also assists in our spiritual well being. There are many benefits to harvesting, gathering plant medicines or wild vegetables. Promote linkages or visits from your local health providers or other specialists. Offer traditional wellness workshops and invite your families to learn through their child's development. Some examples for you collect licorice root to prepare tea for your elders. Gather wild Indian celery, potatoes, or wild elderberries for your salad. Bring a plant medicine book with you to identify salmon berries or a small bucket to collect berries. I'm now going to hand this over to Lynn. Thank you, Laurie. I'm gonna to continue to discuss uh, the final two 
components, um, the social support and family involvement. Invite guest speakers or extend an invitation to weavers, traditional medicine holders, carvers, knitters, drum makers, artists, beaters, hunters, trappers, and other traditional knowledge holders, elders or language speakers. Consider other wellness or healing opportunities or traditional gatherings that you could hold in your community. Invite families to share their members' gifts and or knowledge, such as your favorite traditional foods, crafts, art, dancing, drumming. Families are our wealth of information uh, and, and have so many, uh, so many things that they can offer. Ask them about cedar pulling, harvesting clams, tanning hides, smoking or drying fish, collecting stones, gathering natural materials such as logs, and then you could create a building block set for the children, weaving or beading regalia, harvesting and sharing of healing medicines, teas, um, naming ceremonies, share your good news and what you're doing in the community through newsletters and social media, et cetera. For the nutrition component, share meals, snacks or recipes together, uh, such as what Lori discussed, and with harvested plants, deer, moose, fish, elk, clams, or other traditional items. Share teachings on the harvesting and the fishing and the hunting and the cultural value of our traditional foods. Invite knowledge holders such as hunters and gatherers and offer a workshop to promote awareness and exploration. An example is harvesting licorice fern. It's good for sore throats, colds and coughs, which is great at this time of year. It also grows all year round and can be collected during all four seasons. Learn how to prepare and clean a fish or wild game. Learn safety and ways to preserve. Slide 17, this is another resource from exploring your program series entitled Connections with our Plants, Foods and Medicines. This resource can be found on our website page. Our second resource in the series, Exploring Your Program, we learned the process of invitation, knowledge pathway and transformation, building curriculum, working with plant foods, sacred offerings, animals, body, mind, and spirit. Our BC First Nations peoples harvest a variety of plants, foods, and medicines during different times of the year. Some harvesters may only take the root of a, of a plant, for example, the leaf or the bulb, while others may draw upon the whole plant for its medicinal and spiritual use. It has been told that we only take what we need as we walk softly upon the earth. We encourage you to learn about the procedures and protocols within your community. We have witnessed many communities weaving the relationship of our land-based healing and teachings into their Head Start programs. As we shared earlier, the child is the learner and we have observed the importance of meeting them where they are at. Remember, it's about the process, not the outcome. It's about building the children's confidence as they learn to play through their natural environments. How to incorporate lessons from the land. The land connects the body, mind, and spirit. The land connects us with who we are as spiritual beings and lifelong learners. It presents opportunities for what you may hear, see, touch, smell, or feel. Explore elements such as the earth, rocks, water, trees, air, or metals. This may also include the cosmos, such as the sun, the moon, and the stars. Incorporates all of the developmental domains, such as spiritual, social, emotional, physical, and intellectual and well being. Land based learning has endless possibilities to feed our souls. In the third series of Exploring Your Program, Fostering Education, we explored the process of exchanging knowledge and we highlight the education component. Education is the key social determinant of health and especially in the early years and can have a major influence on the health and the quality of an individual's life. Consider how you will prepare your well-being prior to heading out on the land. For example, what is needed for protection, for witnessing and for reflection. Similar to the use of our oral storytelling, our knowledge and value connects us to our ancestors and how much the land matters to us. Outdoor play 
supports our respect and connection to the land, which is important for our mind, body, and spiritual well being. There are many, many benefits and life skills to be learned through risky play. A few additional positive outcomes include fostering problem solving, building resiliency and persistence, understanding consequences to actions, developing curiosity and wonder, witnessing shifts in the children in their energy, perspectives, inclusion, and positive behaviors. And also one that I want to focus on is imagination, to see what a child can do with a small item and, and reinvent it into uh, the most beautiful thing. It's, it's just wonderful to watch that. Another resource you will find helpful is the BC ELF, which is the Early Learning Framework. This is a robust resource and we invite you to consider the opportunities it presents as you take closer look at land-based learning while weaving in the six components. I'm now gonna hand this over to Tara. Thank you, Lynn. Strong body, strong mind, and strong spirit. Our land is alive and the earth is our mother. We have listened to our elders and our ancestors and our ancient beings who have provided the teachings we need to know. We must walk together and show our children how we travel together as one. This is our time to share, encourage, learn, and grow together. Storytelling has been one of the many pathways to life's lessons, which are passed down through our ancestors. Knowledge was not shared through a book. Rather, it was shared through relationships, experiences, observations, exploration, and valuable teachings or lessons. We can observe the many living markers such as petroglyphs, totems, food caches, root cellars, or homes such as pit houses. The following oral storytelling shares the inspiration of this very connection. Two children and their auntie walk through a valley and reach a large, lonely looking rock. The younger sibling said to the auntie, I don't think I can climb that rock. It looks too big. The older sibling says, it might be a big rock, but I'm even bigger. As the older sibling begins to climb the rock, Auntie says, this rock has been here for many generations and it is our ancestor. The youngest sibling watches the older child climb the rock with big eyes and squeezes her Auntie's hand saying, I'm not brave enough, Auntie. Auntie kneels down and says, little one, you are brave and you are powerful. Your spirit will grow strong and you will have the body as fierce as this ancestor rock. The sides of the youngest child's mouth begin to turn up. Can you help me up there, auntie? Just then, the older sibling jumps down and grabs the youngest child's hand, and they begin to lift the child onto the top of that rock. Together, they laugh and giggle and share how they were strong and brave like the bear. The intention of sharing the story is to inspire the important role of nurturing adults who are fostering education, following the child's lead, while encouraging them to take in the beauty provided by Mother Nature. Our basket and the holistic vision of wellness. Our elders have shared many important teachings with us. When we take a closer look within, we further connect with our highest sense of self and who we are. This includes the four teachings of our spiritual, emotional, mental, and physical well being. The healing journey starts within. As we build upon our tool basket, we weave in our cultural teachings, our prayers, our plant medicines, and our ceremonies. We may also seek support from other healers and knowledge keepers. It has been told that this is how we take good care and the balance between our relationship, our personal power and our energy. Connect, breathe and balance. We are role models and our children, our elders and our families need us for the good work that we do. As we share our gifts with others, we look at the holistic vision of wellness. 
When we do this, we are considering our future generations to come. After all, we are one heart and one mind. In a recent Advancing Early Childhood Development Outdoor Series, round table number three, we heard a beautiful quote by one of our panelists. When taking, or sorry, when talking about the benefits of being out on the land during COVID-19, Liz Williams from Gitwangak First Nation said, healing in the time of fear. We are now going to conduct a poll in order to learn what region you're working in. The results are in. What region do you work in? We have 19% of you from the Northern region, 11% from the interior, 25% from Fraser Salish, 19% from the Vancouver coastal region and 26 from Vancouver Island. Thank you for doing this poll. The First Nation Health Authority Head Start Advisors provide an advanced level of specialized expertise to our communities, our regional teams, and our FNHA external partners. We support a variety of community needs through discussions and recommendations. We are committed to meeting the high operational standards as defined by our BC First Nations and our partners. As each community is at a various different stage of development and a state of readiness, we're here to support you. To further build upon the existing foundation, we encourage community involvement to assist you and your community through key areas such as administration. For example, this can look like training, program planning, design or development, community engagement sessions, budgeting, operations, or further connections to regional team members, such as our environmental health officers. For further support or information on training or workshops, please connect with your First Nation Health Authority Head Start Regional Advisor. Please note that this also can be offered in person or virtually. We are now going to hear from our panelists. We have asked each of our panelists to share their perspective on what recommendations they may have for a community who is wanting to start a land-based program. I'd like to invite Liz to share. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Liz, I come from Kitunga, a small community um, in northern BC. I'm about um, one hour away from Terrace. We are uh, the Aboriginal Head Start on reserve, and we've been in operation since about 1997. Uh, throughout this time, we've always had a focus on our language and our culture. And we have been guided by us, um, who are as well a part of our um, education board. We've, um, we've taken a look and we've planned in the beginning of the year, especially due to COVID, um, to find creative ways to, to be on the land more. Um, uh, we have the on-site plans that we had where we have done a lot of what um, was presented in the PowerPoint of um, creating our gazebos, getting cedar um, 
cedar blocks for chairs outside, uh, making rock paths, um, creating a little fire pit in our smokehouse, which we have on site. Um, just a lot of the natural environment that we have um, as it gets in person in our community. And we also, through the First Peoples Language and Culture Council, we were able to, to have the on-site Jeets, which is the grandmother and the uncle. So they're both as well learning the language um, four hours a day and teaching the language to our little ones. So that's, um, it's such a blessing to see every day, to be going on site and uh, uh, hearing the children respond in the language. I found that um, I went on uh, to the center for the first two weeks and just how they were just um, um, engaging in the language and having fun with the language outside. One of the, the things that we noticed too was the behaviors weren't, um, weren't there once we were outdoors as much as they were indoors. So um, it was just a great time for learning for the children and the staff to have that positive environment um, to draw upon. Um, we also partnership with our um, local school, which um, goes to grade seven. So we, in the beginning of the year, we would plan um, what we have a large community hunting trip. And we do a little survey uh, with our school and our language nest, our Head Start to see, um, especially this year due to COVID, who is interested in coming out on the land. Um, we, we met as a team, um, we did a budget um, to see um, exactly how much it would cost in our program funding to make this happen for the families. Um, because the we really believe that um, um, the land is um, is a part of us as Gitsan people that we need to have that land in order to survive. Um, we were as as mentioned in the PowerPoint. Um, this has all been passed down to our ancestors and um, myself. I have responsibility as a clan member in my community as well as uh, the responsibility of a grandmother, a mother, and an aunt to pass down the knowledge uh, from my generation to the next generation. So this is our goal. Uh, we make sure that um, our young ones um, continue on into the school programs so that their learning just doesn't stop within the Head, uh, Head Start program. Um, when we're out on the land with the, with all of the children, this year there were 30 of us on land and we packed up, um, due to COVID, we talked about, okay, we need to be healthy and uh, have a warm place to sleep so people can be safe and, uh, won't get sick from being cold, um, if it rains. So people that had, um, trailers were welcome to bring those. Um, where we live, we were lucky enough to have a place to, um, similar to cabins to rent for the ones that didn't have trailers so that we could still have the, um, the warm bed, the um, washing up and brushing teeth, still doing all the hygiene stuff while we were out there. So um, that was a big difference this year as to what do we would call roughing it the past few years. Um, so... Um, just the budget and the planning I found was um, the pre-planning was really uh, man, kind of like a mandatory process for us because we want to be prepared for the children and the families while we're on the land, uh, making sure that they have fuel, making sure that we have enough food for them when we go out on the land. Um, planning the menu so we know what to shop for. There was just a lot of that um, planning just as you would for your own family um, if you were going to go out on the land. 
Um, with our elders, we manage to collect medicine and natural teas and, and have that. And a lot of our, our gatherings are, um, are done by the, the older parents, maybe the aunts, the uncles, the grandmothers, but the children are exposed to it and they're with us. And, um, I think that's the beauty of the teaching and the learning is that we're not sitting them down looking at a book. We're actually doing the process with them. So we were out on the land for um, four days, and it was um, just so beautiful to watch the children um, just become more alive on the land. And to me, um, being out on land is health. It's just vital to our well-being, whether it's mental, uh, social, emotional. Uh, we have the parent involvement. Uh, community involvement, there's just so much benefits out there when we're out on the land. We made medicine when we were out on the land, so when we brought that back um, to the center, the staff um, prepared the medicine and it was shared with the ones that, the families that couldn't come with us. So they were still exposed to what we did and the report was done to the community um, the medicine was shared and handed out, and people were just really thrilled with that um, opportunity to have that and to continue with our ways. Um, so the the language um, that comes with being on the land as well is just natural, and there's just so much happening in terms of our language and our culture on the land, and I think that's... Um, a really important connection to make for the young ones that uh, we're having those positive experiences on the land. Um, I'm not sure if I missed anything, but um, I think that through being um, with the Head Start program that a lot of the knowledge that we're, we're learning still daily we, um, we grow trickles into the community and it trickles into the homes. Um, so we are um, all learning to get back out on the land more. And um, yeah, I think it's just a real good experience during this time of COVID where we're learning to take um, more care of children and being more aware of the resources that we do have as Indigenous people living on our territories. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for sharing your good words, your good food, and your good medicine. I acknowledge um, your territory and want to say thank you for sharing the teachings and enriching um, others to learn a little bit about what's happening for you in your community. So thank you for sharing. I'd like to now invite Casey. Thanks. Uh, really, really pleased to be here this afternoon to, um, to, to share some thoughts. Um, so my name is Casey Neathway. I am the Regional Manager for Environmental Health with FNHA. Uh, today I am uh, dialed in, calling in, uh, from the unceded traditional territory of the Silk Nation in Vernon, uh, but I have the privilege of, of working throughout the interior region and visiting all 54 communities. Um, so I, I think the first kind of advice or recommendation that I would give is just um, doing your risk assessments ahead of time. So uh, know the space, know the land you're going to be working on, uh, running your programs on, uh, be aware of it, visit it, uh, and just take uh, take stock of the types of risks that, that might come up during that. Um, talk to people who are really familiar with the land, so um, knowledge holders and, and those who um, have that, that deep connection to the land, they might come up with some thoughts that, uh, that you didn't consider when you're, when you're thinking about a land-based program and what those risks might be. And then really integrate those into your emergency plan and your um, your programming, um, and, and know you know how it's been discussed throughout today.
that uh, risk-based play isn't a bad thing. It, uh, you know, risky play can be very, very beneficial. So don't try to avoid all the risks, just know what they are and, um, and, and mitigate them ahead of time. Uh, if you are a licensed child care program and, and have a license from the Regional Health Authority, uh, be aware of what the uh, requirements might be under the child care licensing regulation and think about how you might continue to be within uh, compliance of those regulations even while you're doing your, your land-based uh, programming. So make sure you have your child files uh, with you. Uh, yeah, make sure you're updating your emergency plan uh, and that parents and families are engaged in that uh, emergency plan as well. So make sure that, that families know what type of program you're going to be doing and where um, and integrate some of their thoughts and considerations into developing that plan. Um, you know, there's mention earlier about staffing levels, absolutely. Um, and if you are bringing on volunteers, just making sure that you have all the appropriate paperwork uh, that you need to, um, to support those people in a good way and things like criminal record checks and, uh, and all those sorts of pieces that are required under the regulations. And then when you're developing your emergency plan, uh, think about communications. So, um, you know, it's, it's not always easy to just pick up your cell phone and, and call a parent or call for help or call an ambulance if, if something goes wrong. Uh, you might need to think about things like uh, two-way radios or, or satellite communications devices. And again, this is just all part of the pre-planning uh, and looking at the potential risks on your land and, and on the space you're going to be working with ahead of time. Um, and then, you know, thinking a, a little bit more about the, uh, I guess, primary considerations for environmental health and, and the types of things that your environmental health officer can, uh, can help with and provide advice on, um, things like health and hygiene. So if you uh, are on the land for uh, a few hours or more, what does bathrooming look like for the kids? So how are they going to the bathroom? Uh, do you have access to, to toilets or outhouses? Uh, or are you going to be um, working with them on uh, on land-based toileting as well and uh, and bearing it and just making sure that you have thought about those things. Um, diapering, uh, you know, is there access to a, a flat spot where you can lay out a, a change pad and uh, and diaper children? And, and what are you doing with the, the diapers and wipes after the fact? How are you disposing of those um, in a good way? Um, it's pretty easy now for, for hand hygiene and, and hand cleanliness. Um, you know, probably a year ago, not everyone would necessarily have a, a bottle of hand sanitizer along with them. But now I think that's, uh, that's pretty much second nature for everybody. So um, just thinking about hand washing and, and hand hygiene, um, especially around the bathrooming piece. Uh, food services, if you're doing some kind of a lunch service, are you bringing bagged lunches along with you? or Are you preparing food on the land? Um, you know, you might have a, have a fire going and you might be cooking. Uh, while you're out there, you might be working with the kids and, and integrating them into the food preparation and the cooking piece. And you want to be sure that, um, you know, e even though you're on the land, you are maintaining those uh, those good food temperatures. So keeping your cold foods less than four degrees and uh, reheating foods to, uh, to 74 degrees. Um, a probe thermometer is a, a really cheap and, and easy way to, to make sure you're covering that piece off. Um, we also like the idea of, of harvesting foods on the land. So uh, again, integrating kids, integrating food into the program. Um, traditional foods are, are such a valuable piece of learning about the land and, um, and how people can, can grow with the land. So have the kids join with you on that food harvesting piece and then make sure that they're, um, they're having some knowledge translation and, and transfer from, uh, from knowledge holders and from people who are really familiar with the land and, and the types of traditional foods and berries and medicines that they might be collecting um, and the types of ways that you might, um, might prepare those to, to eat. So, um, you know, what are the safe ways of consuming those, uh, those items that are gathered from the land? And then again, if you um, you know are, are doing any food prep at all, and you have any kind of uh, food contact surfaces that you're working with, um, just bring along a you know you can get Clorox wipes, although they're a little bit harder to find, uh, or a bleach solution. You know, really easy to mix up a half teaspoon of bleach into a into a half liter spray bottle, uh, and that'll give you about a 200 part per million bleach solution, which will uh, kill anything that uh, might be on those surfaces. And then around the, the comfort and physical safety piece, uh, just thinking of as it's getting colder and you know we're seeing snow in many parts of the province already, uh, how you're keeping kids warm and dry and, and, and parents and volunteers and, and elders as well. Um, 
think about what equity might look like for that type of material. So know that not every child might have access to, you know, the types of, um, of personal protective equipment to, to keep them warm and dry. Um, so you might want to purchase some, some snow suits, some muddy buddies, some uh, chooks and mittens and, and boots and, and all those types of things and have them on hand so that every child can, uh, can have that equity in, in their personal comfort and safety. Um, if you have a shelter area set up, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, whether it's a, a trailer or a cabin, um, or whether you have um, you know a home base or gazebo that you're you're working with, um, ha having that way to kind of get out of the elements. Um, you know, I talked about having a fire for food prep. That's also a good way for people to to stay warm and dry to to huddle up around that fire uh, and escape the elements a little bit. You can also get the propane heaters that just run off a, a one pound bottle of propane. They're, they're fairly inexpensive. Um, not quite as nice as a fire if you ask me, but um, might be a little bit easier um, to, to maintain. Um, think about bringing around a, a tarp or a tent uh, or some you know, aluminum poles, some way to, to set up a shelter if you don't have access to something quite as sturdy or, or permanent as a, as a gazebo or a cabin. Just some way to, to provide that shelter from the elements if it starts to, to snow or rain. Um, and, and of course, thinking about, um, about nap time. So um, you know, if, uh, if you have kids who, who routinely nap, um, you know, they're gonna be expending a lot, of, a lot of energy and it's gonna be super exciting being out in the land. So just thinking about, okay, how are you keeping kids warm and comfortable if, uh, if they really need to go down for a rest uh, throughout the duration of the program? And, you have sleeping bags and blankets and, and sleeping pads and those types of things uh, where you can set them up to, to do that in a good way. Um, so yeah, the, the most important part is just making sure that you uh, know the risks that uh, you might face in your program out on the land uh, and consider the prevention and mitigation for, for each of those risks. So there's tons of developmental value in risky play and, and accidents do happen and that's totally fine. Uh, just be prepared for, uh, for what happens when. That's all for me, thank you. Thank you, Casey. Appreciate your knowledge and sharing today. Uh, bridging the, the worlds together is a, is a very beautiful space and recognizing that uh, Casey works with First Nation Health Authority alongside of our Head Start uh, advisors. And so uh, I encourage each of you uh, in the webinar today to uh, pop into the question and answer box and, and insert those now as we will be in a few moments um, uh, getting into some of those question and answer spaces. Uh, Casey, thank you for the good words today and, and really uh, providing us with a sense of uh, compassion and understanding and knowledge and the courage that uh, it's okay to ask these questions. And we now have our environmental health officers in our land-based communities to facilitate and support those conversations alongside of us. So thank you for that. I'd like to now invite Sequalia. Kai Ochten, welcome and thank you everyone. And thank you, Tara, and to Liz and Casey, thank you for what you shared. I'm going to speak about being an urban nation surrounded by the city and yet we have enough of our river and our trees to be able to have our language nest that we have in our lower mainland at Komalchus and Okamayok, Capilano Village, just under the Lionsgate Bridge. We have the language nest just started this year, well, actually last year. And um, we're able to um, do the program and have elders and knowledge carriers and sometimes the knowledge carriers are young people who have learned from their elders the language and how to make medicines and do weaving. And so they can be brought into the, teach the children how to maybe do a small weaving, like even a bookmark maybe for Christmas. And, you know, maybe take them out into the trail that's just by the heading towards the river and show them the medicines. And I like the sharing that was made about gathering the licorice root and other um, teas and medicines that are out there. 
and being able to also show them how to, I know the proudest thing, some of them are really grateful to bring home and show their parents is when they do cedar bark weaving. And, you know, then the other thing that are um, in the school where we have language um, or like support, First Nation support people was being able to make jam like applesauce and have them um, help prepare that applesauce and put it in a little jar and then bring it home for their mom for Christmas. So it's little things like that that you can do in the program that's really meaningful. And being able to maybe even think about how to do maybe as project at the start of the year, a calendar where they do the coloring and has the numbers or did something different every month and they learn the language. Because that's a real foundation to be able to be teaching them when they're in the Head Start programs, the language because our old people used to say their brains are like sponges and you put that in there when they're under six, it'll stay there all their life. And even in, and then in that way, encourages the family, the parents and grandparents to be learning the language with them also if they haven't, if they don't already know it because we need to bring that back because our old people always said that having our language and culture in one hand, and they always use the left with um, close to the heart, language, culture, and what you carry helps you with your education. And later in life, when you need to get a job, you have stress. It's knowing your culture and getting on the land and bringing in people who can share, like um, I believe it was Liz said, um, how to um, process fish and not be scared of doing it. Because I had seen a video where um, um, this lady taught her um, young granddaughter who was probably only five, how to use one of those tools like the Inui use. And she was a totter and had faith in her not to cut herself, to f cut a fish and fillet it. And she was just like five years old and she was doing it slowly and had been shown. And she was said, I don't think I can do it. And her grandmother said, yes, you can. And then being able to teach them to have that spiritual connection because um, that was talked about by Tara when she shared is um, being able to know those things that are protocols and you teach them when they're little like that, they'll remember it for their whole life. And that's like my grandson who's always been around us and since he is a baby and he just observed and watched us in our longhouse. And one time he was um, probably about seven or eight and we were at a naming and he was playing his um, DS game, but he kept looking and watching and then he stopped and he watched and he went, they're not doing that, right? And I was sitting beside him and I went, pardon me? And he goes, they're not doing that right. And I went, what? And he says, they're, they're not doing it right. And you should go down there and tell them. And I was like, um, and here I had been sitting there thinking in my head, oh, no, they're not doing it right. But he was like a little boy who had always seen it. He just said it. And I, I was thinking it and then I was like, well, I can't go down there, grandson, because I'm one of the people who helps make sure things are done right, usually. And I said, I can't go down. They have someone who's supposed to be helping them do it right. And they said, well, they don't know because they're doing it wrong. You should go down there. And I went, I can't. 
And then I said, I, I wish I could. And he went, well, that's not right. And he went back to playing his game. And that was from observing what we show them and mimicking. And it's not even mimicking. It's learning to live their culture and being a, and um, after he is back playing a few minutes later, about five ladies, because in our longhouse, we're all on the second and third row in that. And I was on the back row with him. And they all said, he's right, you know. He was absolutely right. And you should have went down and told them. I went, and, um, you know, and that's the importance of having them there and being able to always, like, I always encourage um, the parents and grandparents that no matter how old you are, um, an old dog can learn new tricks. And some of them need to know like that um, meme that gets shared. Use your language every day, even if you can't speak it fluently. Use the words you know, and then you'll start learning more. And, you know, I always remember the day when I um, encouraged the young people saying, you need to learn your language and culture. And then I was at their grad ceremony reading their posters on the wall and it said, I want to respect my elders and speak my language to them and not use English. And I started crying because I went, oh my God, I'm the elder they're going to talk to and I'll need a translator because I'm not fluent in the language yet. And so, you know, I shared that with everyone and that sparked everyone to start learning together. And that's what our old people call Chin Chin Dwight standing and working together to hold each other up, support one another, help each other. And we do it through the generations. And it's also how we're breaking the cycle of the multi-generational impacts of residential school by getting back to what our old people, how they lived and could survive off the land. Because the prophecies say that when that it's those who know those old ways that are always going to survive. So my hands are up to each and every one of you for your programs and for bringing back those teachings. Tama kwitsi snechem hoi chacha. Thank you so much for sharing your good words, your good heart, your good medicine. The Qualia has been working with the Regional Head Start Advisors for numerous years, and it's a, a privilege to have her sitting in this work again with us. So, uh, Gaila Kasla Haichka, thank you for your good words. I'm so excited to um, share that we're now going to look at some of the question and answers in our Q&A box um, to further look at uh, some questions for our panelists. So, Denise is going to and has been looking at the questions uh, in that box and is going to support the panelists, uh, members here to respond. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Tara. Yeah, so there's, there's some questions and I'm just going to read them because the people who will listen to the recording uh, will not have access to the chat box. So I just wanted to read them out. So uh, one of the questions was, can staff participants receive a Pro-D certificate? And so if you email your uh, Head Start advisor, uh, your FNHA Head Start advisor or myself, um, and if you can give us your community where you're from and how you spell your name, then we can um, email that to you. Another housekeeping item was, can we get a copy of the slides used in this presentation? So we are recording this webinar and we will upload that recording along with a copy of the slide um, hand notes for the participants. Um, another question was on, is there a good resource on wildlife safety? There was some sharing the playgrounds with a wolf and a bear. And Casey, uh, did you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Wild Safe BC is a, a really good resource. If you go to their website, it's wildsafe.ca, I think. 
uh, wildsafebc.com. Uh, and then if you click on the learn button, there's some really good resources in uh, reducing conflict with, uh, with wildlife. Uh, so they're the ones who created the um, Bear Aware program that some of you might be familiar with from a long while ago. And I didn't actually realize that wasn't the name of it anymore, but they'd be a good primary option to get some resources on uh, wildlife safety. All right. And we had another um, question about cultural teachings and formats, and, and can it be facilitated in a child-friendly way? Uh, I think that really is dependent upon uh, who are your uh, elders and your knowledge keepers and uh, people in your community that you can bring in and share that with your um, um the children and i don't know liz did you have anything that you wanted to add to that about um do you talk about what those teachings are and how they are going to be delivered in a child-friendly way uh, <clears throat> i'll use one maybe the fish example um when we're doing fish um, because we have an on-site smokehouse um when we brought the fish to the um to the playground or the grounds, um, we had um, a lot of the older siblings from the school come over and help with it, and our, our grandmother and our uncle. And the ways in which the younger ones got to help with the fish was they would be down by the bin washing the fish. They would come and want to clean the fish, so they would have a spoon to help clean the fish. So, and these are were the four-year-old children, and a lot of the younger ones love to help wash them. So, there's different ways um, on the comfort level of the people that are working with, and I think that's the beauty of the multi-age teaching as well that we have. And if there is no older siblings, I think that the staff can be just um, the ones that can allow the children to do um, what's developmentally appropriate for them. Thank you, Liz, for sharing. Uh, and then we have another question that what is the average number of hours for outdoor programs? Do people have part time outdoors and part time in? That really depends on your community and what your community needs are and uh, what's going to work in your community by consulting your families and um, making that decision on your own. The other question that we had in the chat box, Lily was asking, would you recommend propane heaters for winter environments? So I'm gonna let Casey answer that as well. Yeah, absolutely. They're a great option. Uh, just be aware that they do have to be properly vented. So depending on what your shelter situation is, uh, if you're in you know, a partially enclosed space, uh, you'll want to have an uh, actively working carbon monoxide detector in there because they do give off carbon monoxide. But they're, they're fantastic. They're efficient. They're super warm. Um, yeah, good option. Okay. I know that we're uh, nearing the end of our question period, so I will choose one more. Um, what, um, what activities would you recommend for parent engagement in land-based activities? Liz, do you want to, and, and also there was another one around the land-based activities in winter. So Liz, if you could just uh, take this final question and since you are in the North, um, you probably have some good examples of what that would look like for parent engagement, for land-based activities, and we'll just throw in in winter. Well, I think that um, the winter one is um, is is going to be a new one for this year, just due to the COVID. A lot of our times, our winter would be around storytelling and song and dance, and also learning about our feasts. And this year, um, we we're going to be taking a look at how that would be due to the COVID safety measures that will need to be taking. So um, maybe we can keep updated or connected in some way to, um, to maybe share what we're doing and what other people are doing. 
Lynn, can I um, get you to maybe um, share an example of what happened with your grandson's outdoor school uh, in the north? You're just on mute, yeah. About the dinosaurs? Yeah. My grandson, um, they had, <clears throat> when he was in uh, grade one, it was a kindergarten grade one split and the teacher had an outdoor program one day a week. And that was on Thursdays. So from the time they got to school until the end of the day, they were outside. And so that teacher was very creative in a lot of the activities that the children did. And, and one that um, we really highlighted was asking the farmers and the hunters around here if they had carcasses left over uh, and any bones, that sort of thing, any skulls. And she took them down to the park by the river and buried them all. And that was when the children were doing um, a section on dinosaurs. So there was bones enough in each of the, the children were put into groups and then they all had a dig area. And so they got enough bones out of there to do a really loosely based dinosaur. So there was a skull and there was some rib bones and, and that sort of thing. So it was just an, a really awesome way to learn about uh, the history of dinosaurs, to learn about uh, the structure of the body, to it just, it was amazing the different concepts that came out of that. And, and it was, that's one that I really liked. Thanks for sharing. Share something? Yes. Um, in our Squamish Valley, it's kind of urban and yet it's rural. We have with the school district a school up to grade seven that teaches um, cultural teachings and with academic. And one of the things they do for science is um, go out with the elders and meet them at the river and put out the um, the tree branches that herrings lay eggs on and put it in the water. And then they learn about the ecosystem in that. And then after when it's time to gather it, they all go down and gather it. And this is their science and English class because, you know, and there's little kids there, some of them are autistic. And that's how they learn to do the things on the land and gather the herring roll on the branches. And then they, go and give it to the elders who are with them. And so it's like sharing of language. And then they were at the outdoor school learning how to, um, and there was some little children there with them from like the Head Start, learning, showing like um, Liz was sharing, how to clean fish and how to process it. So it's getting them to be able to start learning when they're little so that, as they get older, like some, especially young girls might go, ooh, no, I don't want to do that. But they are learning that that's how we survive and it's a part of our life. And those young kids are going to, you know, have a lot of land-based knowledge. And that's how we um, teach them even to start liking our foods again, because we got away from it for a long time. Now it's getting back to learning again, even how to, you know, make the smoked fish, how to make the jerky. So I just had to share that because um, you triggered me. And then the snow thing is being able to know how to find things during the winter, even if there is snow, like how the deer find food. So we learn from them as well. Thank you, Sequoia, for your good words. It uh, reminds me of our next slide um, because we have so many resources that are out there and people are asking questions about where can they access this knowledge. So um, similar to what we've heard so far, there are numerous resources that are out there. And so here is a, a list of different websites that we've been referencing. Um, and these will be included in participant handouts. Um, in the coming weeks, we'll, we'll, we will be posting um, the recorded version of the webinar and other um, links for you. I want to reiterate that the First Nation Health Authority Head Cert Advisors are here to support 
those community connections and working with traditional knowledge keepers, knowledge sharers or elders or other good work um, and members within your community. We also um, just want to quickly draw your attention to the next slide, which has um, food medicines, wild food medicines, uh, the early learning framework we spoke to, um, and also we had referenced earlier the advancing early childhood education outdoors now. The roundtables are now live and can be found on, your, on their website, so we encourage you to take a look at that. The next slide, uh, we just wanted to uh, acknowledge our environmental health regional managers. Thank you, Casey, for um, sharing the information for each one of the regions. Uh, you can always connect with your regional uh, First Nation Health Authority um, Head Start Advisor and they can connect and bridge those conversations. Again, there might be further questions in community partners such as licensing officers, your chief and councils, your um, health directors and so forth. And in final, um, you may have further thoughts or questions after this webinar. And so we encourage you to continue those thoughts um, as we move forward. Uh, we're gonna launch a, 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 a poll um, and just want to quickly hear a little bit um, from you. So a land-based learning program is a good fit for my community. This is a multiple choice uh, question. So if you can go ahead and fill out the poll. While you're completing that, we just would like to offer our sincere gratitude for uh, your time together today, your precious time as you're all busy. We want to also acknowledge the territories and uh, that each one of you are calling in from um, and really look forward to supporting you as you move forward. And it looks like the results are that most of you, it's about 59% that strongly agree, 29% agree and 17, they're unsure. So just really wanna say thank you for sharing that and knowing that you're not alone. We're in this together and we're here to support you and your communities. We encourage you to continually dream, create those wish lists. You just never know what's around the corner. If you're thinking about program designs and developments, reach out to your First Nation Health Authority Head Start Advisor. Before we end, we would like to have a closing prayer and wanna just mention one more housekeeping item that when we conclude this and it's recorded, it's recording version, we will post it on our website. Um, so none of this is going to be lost information. We will share it with you widely. Thank you. I would now like to invite Sequalia to end us with a closing prayer. Oh, sorry. I, I just had one last thing. When you end the webinar, you're going to be asked three questions for a survey. And if you could fill that out, that would help us learn. So thank you very much for your time and spending the afternoon with us. Over to you, Sequalia. Thank you. I, um, I've really enjoyed this afternoon and I thank all the presenters and really thank my fellow panelists, Liz and Casey, for the sharing that they had. It was really um, informative and shows how to move forward in a good way. And I thank the others. So I'm just going to do the closing prayer. I see... Um, Denise is ready. And um, I'm just going to do a prayer, not a song. So I'll say, Chenkwe mentomi kakakanik chesiam yonsi onso tunoi up in manman to squiles to seats, yonsi on manman squawan, yonsi on manman sequatal chet, siai chet squawan. Asking you, Creator, to put a watch over, guide and protect all of your children gathered here today as well as their families and friends with their mental, emotional, physical, spiritual health and well-being. Asking you creator to help them in the work that they do with um, families and man man, the children so that we um, go forward and teach our young children how to have that pride in who they are and where they come from in the land and connection they need to have 
Thank you, Creator, and hear our prayers for all our family of serious illnesses, especially with COVID right now and those who may have it or are recovering. And for all those with all the other serious illnesses and maybe injuries and waiting for treatments or surgery, prayers, hear our prayers for their health, healing, and recovery. Asking you, Creator, to hear our prayers for all of our family and friends who have traumas and are battling drugs, whether it be um, alcohol, legal drugs through prescription drugs or illegal drugs, especially right now with the fentanyl opioid crisis that's taking a lot of young people lately in communities, asking prayers for them and those who are incarcerated who may get out and not realize that how strong the drugs are since they last used them. Prayers for them to find the healing path to recovery. Prayers for those, all their families who worry about them and don't want to lose them and have a lot of anxiety. Pray to lift up their spirits and help them. Asking you, Creator, to hear our prayers for all our family and friends who may have lost loved ones and have am squalling strong feelings of grief. To know our loved ones, as my old people taught me, worry about us who are left here on our life journey and that they will always walk with us and help us in a spiritual way whenever they can. And I was learned and read with that dragonflies have two sets of wings because they carry angels on their backs or a ladybug is an angel coming to give you a kiss when it lands on you or you see an eagle wolf something that makes you if you're having a low day low spirits and you see it and it lifts you up and you're smiling that's your loved ones that are your guardian angels walking with you so always know that we have that protection and thank you creator for such a beautiful day that we've shared together and asking you again to take care of everyone in their families. Those are my words and I say thank you. I'm grateful that I was able to share a part of your day with you and that I learned from each and every one of you. Because as the old people say, we never stop learning until we leave this earth. And we'll chai up you. You all take care. Thank you. You will now see a survey being posted. Gaila Kessler Sequalia, thank you to all of you for participating. Thank you for joining us. And we're now going to stop the recording.